Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 4 of Whelmed, season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily and... Producer Neil. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. <laughs> I'm sorry, McCann. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Involuntary. The release date was October 28th, 2021. The in episode date was March 25th. The writer was Francisco Paredes. Uh, the director was Christopher Berkeley. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits this week include Dee Bradley Baker as Chameleon Boy and Carmang. Troy Baker as Res Edda. Ben Diskin as Makamo Ors. Zara Fuzzle as Sierra Smith and Jarlia Jax. Phil Lamar as Jem Jax. Uh, Carrie Walgren as Phantom Girl and Saturn Girl. And Hinden Walsh as Emery Johns. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts with Miss Martian, Superboy, and Beast Boy saying goodbye to Bioship and making us all sob. We then cut over to the Martian arena, where Makam hides the gene bomb he received from Dasad last episode. And after the credits, McGann confronts her brother in his cave hideout to apologize for abandoning him when she left for Earth, but Makam refuses to reconcile with their family. Wedding preparations continue, and Emery endeavors to sort out her relationship with McGann. Later, our heroes regroup at the arena to continue investigating the king's death and go to question one of the servants who entered the palace on the night of the murder. From him, they learn that their leading suspect was actually a garoon posing as an Ah Shen to get into the palace. Later, at the prince's birthday celebration, Prince Jem seems disquieted by the news of their new lead suspect, and Connor realizes that the microscopic residue he saw at the crime scene was actually the result of Martian magic. With this new information, the pieces finally fall into place, and it's revealed that Priestess Sira killed the king. The full story is that Sira snuck into the palace to plead her case to the king and convince him to let her marry Jim. But when he dismissed her, she became upset and lost control of her magical powers and accidentally killed him. But with one mystery solved, that means the king's death was unrelated to the destruction of the Zeta tube and the communication satellite. As news of Sira's confession and arrest spreads through the Martian population, Res Edda attempts to spin this as a justification for the Martian caste system. But Prince Jim steps up and insists that the caste system is at the heart of all of Mars's problems and that the only way forward is through dismantling it and building a better, more equitable society. The Queen agrees with her son and declares that this conversation will continue. After the birthday celebration, we gotta get that done first. <laughs> Elsewhere, Superman and Martian Manhunter arrive in the Javelin, and as the prince's celebration continues, uh, that guy floating around in a giant glowing bubble adds something to the gene bomb. The noise, as well as the psychic presence of the Legion of Superheroes, tips off our heroes and they discover the bomb beneath the royal box at the arena. McGann realizes that the virus contained within will likely target all non aa Shen in the arena, and since she's biracial and Garfield has her blood in his system, they have no idea how the bomb will affect either of them, meaning Connor's the only one who can safely destroy it. Miss Martian and Beast Boy evacuate the arena while Connor attempts to destroy the bomb. Due to his time away from the sun, he's weaker and clearly in pain as he dives into lava to ensure that the virus is eliminated. And while the virus is neutralized, the bomb still explodes. McGann and Gar rush to investigate, but can't find any signs of Connor and Superman's arrival on the scene reveals that there are still trace amounts of kryptonite in the air. All evidence points to Connor having died in the explosion, and no one's okay. Absolutely Nobody's no okay. one. None of us, none of them. None. Not, not so a single much. person. No. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Boy, Aster, I love this episode. Ha <laughs> 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 It's a real fun episode till the last two minutes. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Wow. It's, a, it's just a lighthearted episode right here. For sure. Nothing like dead father's racial tension and losing a character that we've loved for many years. Hey, it's birthday time. Birthday party. Birthday party. Yeah, that's what uh, happened. Yeah, this is fine. This is fine. We're all fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, Neil, let's start with you. What do you got going on? Okay, so I'm going to start in the middle because I want to remember this one because I was telling it to my own children recently. Um, I like that Jim steps in and it's one of my go-to phrases is that repetition is not justification. The idea that like this is the caste system has been the mm. way that we've always done it. That's not correlating to whether or not it is something that should still then be done. Like repetition is not justification, no matter how big or small it is that you have to justify it to me in a very different way. Um, and just because I've always done it is not, that's not it for me. Um, so I really like that that's kind of at the forefront of like, yeah, this is the way we've always been. That doesn't mean anything like, you know, we've interacted, we've developed like our society as a whole is how much bigger even just from what a couple years ago. So the idea that like we would just keep that same caste system no matter what it is. I mean, obviously, this one is one that needs some serious revisions, but the idea that any system would sustain mm-hmm. that the level of growth that the Martians have had is absurd. So, yeah, repetition, not justification. And you, can I add to that? Yep. Well, so back when I was in the ICU at UCSD, there was a there was it was actually like just part of the culture that we had a thing we called digging for dinosaurs. And I think several hospitals do this because there's things that we do as nurses that we're just like, yeah, this is what I was taught and this sounds right. And it's, it sounds like it's okay. But then after a while we find out like, wait, why are we doing this? Is there actual research to back this or, and sometimes there is other times there's not, you know, like we turn our patients who are innovated and unconscious, we turn them a little bit on their side every two hours. It's, it's got a bunch of benefits theoretically, but where did two hours come from? Why is it not one hour? Why is it not five hours? Why is it, you know, it's just like two hours sounded good at some point in time. We'll do that. Right. And so it's, it's taking time to do deep, to dig into it and do research and find out if that's actually something that needs to work. So again, what'd you say? how do you say, how'd you phrase that? Repetition is not justification. Right. That. So it's any system, like we're talking about race, racial systems here and, and stuff like that, that can be applied in, you know, some but it's 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 big systems it's small systems it's all systems <laughs> family systems right well and i think a lot of it stems a lot of it stems from families and you know, having certain things that are particular to your own group and the funniest one i ever remember and i don't know if i saw it online if someone had told me but w- uh, a woman would go to make a ham and she would cut off the end of the ham and then put it in the pot yes. And then put it in there. And the the question she gets questioned like, well, why do you do that every time? She's like, well, that's the way I was taught. And she's like, well, okay. So goes back to her mom. Let's and ask says, grandma. You cut the end of the hand <laughs> off. Yeah. And then it was basically like, oh, well, I just had a really small pot, <laughs> and it, the hams would never fit, so I just cut the ends off. It's like, wait. So then I does it make it cook better? It doesn't taste better? It doesn't do anything? Just- so I've just been throwing ham away. Perfectly, perfectly good ham. For no reason other than I thought I was supposed to just <laughs> throw it in the trash for decades. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, exactly. The other, I mean, I can also say that the, for whatever reason, there wasn't a ton of the 16 stuff in these early ones. Um, again, there's a couple timestamps in there, um, but we'll, I'm sure uh, the farther we go on, the more we will find. What else you got? You got anything else? Uh, I mean, I don't know if we would move it to the Canary Debrief, but the idea that we've resolved the one thing only to leave. It's almost like having, not really having the rug pulled out from under you, but enough to say, oh, none of these things are related. I have so many more additional questions. Questions, mind you, that will not get answers immediately by any stretch. And questions that get sidetracked by the ending of this episode that uh, makes you forget everything else that you were worried about because now there's a bigger problem (laughs) or at least a more personal problem. Yeah. What gets me is that mysterious guy in the uh, this time bubble. He changed several things in history. If he hadn't showed up to put the kryptonite addition 
on top of that bomb. He he yeah. left and left it open, right? He left and left it open, which is why they even knew where it was. Yeah. And as I think I mentioned last episode in the comics, Malifa Ak is the Martian who murdered every other Martian. So if he hadn't gone back in time to try to save Superboy, a couple of things theoretically would have happened, right? Maybe Superboy survives because it's just a virus. Right? We, we don't know how big the bomb was supposed to be. So the virus would have wiped, you know, a, some number of Martians out. Maybe by color, probably not the way Desaad was giggling. But like all the Martians, right? And Martian Manhunter would have survived because he was, was he on the planet? Was he? Oh, he he had just arrived with Superman, right? Just before then. But the only reason, but the only reason he would arrive with Superman is because of what had already happened to the satellite. Right. So he would have been on Earth when everything happened. Maybe, possibly. So whoever this is, right? They're like, okay. So I'm going to put this kryptonite here, and I'm going to nonchalantly walk away and leave this invisibility cloak I borrowed from Harry Potter or whatever over the top of this thing open so that people can find the thing and I'm going to leave so that Superboy comes down and he dies because of the kryptonite, right? He had to put the kryptonite on there the to kill him. It's not like the bomb would have just blown up and killed Superboy on his own. So he felt like he needed to put the kryptonite on there. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm killing Superboy and also leaving all the Martians alive to go to the future. Wait, what? Like suddenly like this entire, like this, this, <laughs> this, Species of being that we've been talking about that are so powerful and so prolific, suddenly they're not wiped out. I think that's going to affect something at some point in time down the line, right? <laughs> Were they supposed to die, but they didn't die in the, on this particular Earth? Like it gets it gets in- complicated and interesting as to what was supposed to happen and what his attempt to kill Superboy with this kryptonite thing kind of threw a bunch of stuff off. Thoughts? Just processing that, because it's one of those things where, especially even with some of the things that we learn later about the timeline this season without spoilers, like I don't think I'd ever fully processed how many things are technically changed, because I'm not sure if it ever, like this thing that you have brought up, I don't think ever gets mentioned, even though you're like, yeah, that would, that if that's the way things, because we don't know what. We are never told what the canon timeline to the Legion of Superheroes is. Like, we don't know what events have to happen other than this one. That is, like, the only one that they keep telling us has to happen, of Superboy has to live. And it's in the show, and it's it's pretty easy to find. I mean, the, the Legion of Superheroes showed up as, as in, you know, a, a backup comic in Action Comics, and then later was called literally Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes yeah. for years and years and years. Right. So no, no big crash in the mode there. So like, yeah, Superboy's got to survive. Okay. But he, but he, he's dead. He's looking super dead right now. But then all the Martians are alive. I think so weird to me. Crash yeah. In the mode, Cause then we can say, then we can say all of the words stuff. and all of the things. All right. All right. Well, let's do that. Let's do that. That's, that's my, that's one of my big ones. Okay, I have a question about Martian-based powers. So she accidentally kills the king. It's that's that's known. It is, it is not. She, it is not intended. And then she leaves through the plumbing. <laughs> and I have questions yeah. about that because she's just like, blah, 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 and then just like turns into goo, and then just goes into the fountain and leaves. <laughs> and I quote, "Through the plumbing." And I was just like, "Yes." Ow! I have follow-ups because one. I don't know why you didn't d- density shift. Maybe that's not something you have. Two, I didn't think you could do that. We've never seen it done. Like, <laughs> oh, really? Okay. In, in Young Justice, we've never seen them do that Mm-mm. before. Like, not like no, that. No, we've oh. never seen like straight up not like all of McGann's shape shifting that we have seen has been like within the bounds of remaining mostly humanoid. Like she has gr- grown extra limbs or. In the comics, at w- is in the comics at one point she turns into an animal one time, but it's like a gorilla. I th- she turned into a gorilla, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, even yeah, then, yeah. you're like, that's Whoa. kind of close yeah. enough that you're like, okay, that's not that's not crazy. Like she didn't turn into a bird. <laughs> like 
And Martian Manhunter never does really either. He turns into John Jones. Okay, so I think everything that's in my head is like... Comics? Everything that's in my head that I'm visualizing, no, no, is, well, yes, and also all the animated scenes with him doing crazy, like, wild nonsense is from Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. Probably. (laughs) Because he does all kinds of stuff in there. And then any of the DC animated movies, like, the majority of which are amazing. So, like, when she did that, that's fine with me. Because for for a couple reasons, one, she loses control, not of her Martian powers. She loses control of her innate magic, which is like a whole different thing. Yeah, that's where I have some questions. We can get back to that in a minute. But then when she like (laughs) goes through the plumbing, well, because I mean, McGann already says like, oh, density shifting is a very advanced technique that you've got to learn, which kind of makes sense. (laughs) But like they all shape shift all the time. Well, even even initially when she can only be women. Oh, right. That's true. Yeah. She had a hard time being. Yeah, that's right. That's true. And so I kind of get it didn't even phase me that she well, it didn't phase me that she shapeshifted to leave the plumb through the plumbing. What kind of phased me is like the magic thing we'll get to in a minute. But nobody thought of that. Like nobody thought like, oh, well, they would have gotten. How did they escape? Oh, somebody somebody didn't leave. I have problems with this as well. (laughs) I think the in-universe explanation for that is the in-universe explanation for the entire fact that this has remained a mystery for so long in that the the apparent thing of on Mars, murder just doesn't happen because it's really hard to keep it a secret. So the Martians have no experience figuring this out. <laughs> I, I And I think that's, I, I don't know, I think that it's, it's really valid. Like they just don't have, they just don't have that thing. Right, it's just not part of the part of the zeitgeist in their in their in their mentality. There's one Martian out there that has watched every detective show that uh, the Earth has ever produced <laughs> in the past forty years, and he's sitting at home with a conspiracy theory board, being like, "I know who did it," but nobody's asked him. And you know what's extra funny? <laughs> what's extra funny is that to me, which is that John Jones in his original form back in the fifties. Yeah, he was a Martian who had Martian powers, but he wasn't actually really a superhero because like in the 1950s, there were comics were starting. To, it was it was the it was um, Seduction of the Innocent. There was all that stuff going on in the 50s. There's so many reasons why why comics were the way they were in the 50s. Right. And so they superhero comics were super minimal. And all the other comics, like EC comics and horror and pirates and all romance, those were huge. And then eventually the seduction of the innocent thing came up. I don't want to get too much into that, but then then they rebooted all these old that's where you get the Jay Garrick flash becoming the Barry Allen science flash, right? And the Alan Scott Green Lantern becoming the Green the the Hal Jordan science Green Lantern, right? And so that happened then. But Marsha Manhunter was before that. And so he he comes to Earth and he shape changes into a human and becomes a police detective. That's what he does for a living. And so most of these comics early on with Martian Manhunter are ones where he's literally solving murder mysteries because he's like, whoa, you guys don't know. He did it. <laughs> that guy right there. He's thinking he's thinking about it right now. That one. Amazing. Oh, wait, you need proof. Oh, oh, proof. Oh, that's interesting. I'm going to try and figure out how to get proof. I'm like, that's the first thing he did was become a police detective. He's like, it's so, he's so easy. He's just so easy, guys. Just start looking into everybody's brain. Come on. Yeah, just look into the brains. What's the problem? Um, but that actually gets me into another thing that that got me was, I don't think this is used anywhere. in the. I couldn't find any reference to this particular word. Um, and I think it's because Greg and Brandon and was it Nicole? Nicole Dubuque was working when she was writing scripts. They were working on the Martian language together. Uh, I know that she she works on some of the languages. I can't remember if Martian was one of them, but she worked on some of the stuff in season two, definitely. Yeah. So the Mahanthers, right? Which are these like security guard things that we see in there. Well, that's just the word manhunter, Yeah. right? It's the Mahanthers, right? So he's Martian manhunter because Jean used to be one of those. And there's some stuff. I can't remember who wrote it. Unfortunately, I, I was trying to look it up again and I couldn't find it. There's references to John talking about like, oh, yeah, the, the man hunters is what it would be in English, maybe. But we're not really that we're kind of police, but we're not. We're kind of military, but we're not. We're kind of, yeah, you know, a uh, bounty hunter, but we're not like 
we're, we're something else, but like the closest thing you have is maybe like a police officer. And so I guess I'm going to kind of be that and see what that's like here. Cause that's what I'm normally like. And then that led him into becoming like a superhero. I love the fact that they put into this thing that they're called Mahunters and they made it like almost like the word manhunter in, in English. It made me really, really happy. I don't think I even noticed that the first time. It took me until my most recent watch through to realize I didn't write this down, but um, that Garoon is obviously supposed to look and sound like green and Yellone is looks and sounds mm-hmm. like yellow. It took me until this time through of jotting something down that I realized uh, uh, Shen is supposed to look like ashen, yeah, for, instead of just mm-hmm. white. Uh, and I was like, oh, can't believe it. Th- that didn't click until just now, but very cool. I didn't notice that one. What's it? What's the other one? Blood. Blood. Then. So like blood. Red. Oh, blood. Blooden. Yeah. Blooden. I I literally just now, as I said it out loud, yeah. <laughs> got it. It's cool. I like it. Sorry. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. It was well. It was it was interesting and subtle enough that I didn't catch it as an obvious reference. Yeah. So. Good. Hats off to that. And also, now I feel like, wait, what? Why didn't I get that? So some of my notes uh, for this one, this episode, ju- jumping back a little bit, I just really like the idea that McGann has like an underground following and respect among the White Martians that like up till this point, all of the reactions oh, yeah. we've been seeing about Miss Martian and her being on Earth have been like either green Martians who think she's weird or people who need her right now accepting her help. And then seeing this group of white Martians of like, Carmang seems pretty proud of her and everything that he has heard that she's done. And like, there are little, there are little kid white Martians in the background who are like sneaking and trying to like overhear the conversation who seem like have the vibe of like, Oh my God, it's her. And I'm like, I love this. I love this idea. It's very cool. Makes me think of Connor in season three, where he's like the like the go to genomorph of like, yeah. hey, you're you know you're out front, yeah, and you can help us and, and do these things. And so like it was just on this rewatch where it like echoed some of those same things where it's like, oh yeah, like hey, you're out there, you're doing it, and we we love that and we want to support you. Um, and also, it, it, hopefully, it makes our lives better by seeing you know you helping represent uh, the best that we could be. Yeah. That's very good. It's a, yeah. it's a, just a cool little thing that like it isn't even dwelled upon for that long. It's just that one scene. But I'm like, oh, I want I want to learn more about this. I want I keep wanting to know all of the Martian world building. <laughs> Give me all of the Mar- Martians' opinions on everything that they're learning from Earth, please and thank you. What else do we got? Nothing else really happened. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so that's here. <laughs> I did notice this time through something that I don't think I would uh, realized specifically but there is a cool little bit of visual storytelling that i noticed this time through that after prince jem gives his speech they cut to emery who is waiting for martian manhunter and superman to arrive and the way that they cut that scene is that you hear the lingering audio of the stadium and then her eyes go from glowing to normal and she just smiles to herself and i think i always processed what was happening but this time through i realized oh they are literally showing us that she is like psychically watching the live stream of this speech at work essentially like she is hearing what is happening right. uh and is is happy to hear that we are apparently going to try to improve mars uh which is nice good on you emery i was saying the psychic equivalent of her, of on earth where she'd be looking at her phone when somebody walks up yep <laughs> uh it was very good i liked that this time through um and then if we're if we're going to get into the sad bit that is, you know, the the core of the episode, the whole thing that happens at the end. Like, I know nope, 10 I'm things done. happen in this episode. Let's do that. <laughs> we got like 10 other things. We got a mystery that gets solved and we got superhero legion of superheroes doing stuff. But uh, so, so Connor in that explosion. So a couple of notes, <laughs> a couple of notes. We have the exchange with McGann and Connor of her saying, be careful, Connor, and him saying, always, and I'm fine. It's fine. This is fine. But also, it's a very good little callback to both her saying, be careful, Connor. I love you in failsafe, which also makes me cry. And their exchange in Nightmare Monkeys, where she says, you're my anchor, and he responds with always. And I cry at all of the callbacks to these two 
telling each other to be safe before they go do very dangerous things. <laughs> this is fine. Um, also, <laughs> I it's realized okay. on my... It's what Superman would do. No! <laughs> Rich, you can't hurt me with uh-huh. season uh-huh. one things. <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> season Fail four. Safe. Um, it's fail safe all day. I also realized in a rewatch of this episode that when they are showing everyone evacuating the arena, two of the people that they show not evacuating the arena are McGann's parents because they can't yep. leave and they can't bring themselves to abandon their kid. And I'll just go cry about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just go cry about this whole thing. Every possible detail of this of these final scenes is just designed to hurt us. <laughs> The, the whole conversation with Macomb, just his whole like, say goodbye, say goodbye to mom mm-hmm. and, and tell, dad, uh, tell dad I'm sorry. And it's like, yeah, it's it's awful. It's yeah. just awful. Yep. Like, there's so many ways to read him saying stuff like that. And then, like, I just can't. I just, I mean, no Martian should have survived. None of them. Like, I think the only reason Milo Fox survives because he was off planet and he knew what was going to happen. And then or maybe he inoculated himself in the comics. I don't exactly know what happened there, but I know that he and John were two of the only ones that survived until they introduced Miss Martian. Dude, that's messed up. You are messed up. There are parts of McComb's story where I am totally sympathizing with him. But just say, like, say goodbye to mom. I'm like, dude. Yeah. And I also rewatching that scene is so interesting because. There is a point in that scene where rewatching it, you feel like McGann has almost got through to him for like half a second. And then he switches back Mm -hmm. to no, no. Like it's her saying she has her whole apology. And it's the second that she calls him Makam instead of Ma'ala Fa'ak that he's like, no, that's not what I am. And I'm not backing down. And we're not doing this today. And I'm like, okay. I I love his shock of just like, she's like, that's not why I'm here. And he's like, well, why are you here then? And she's like, I'm here to say I'm sorry. And his reaction of like, wait, wait, what? Like, that's not how these conversations are supposed to go. Yeah. Right. Everybody's a jerk and they all, everybody, everybody, I'm burning the world to the ground. Yeah. No one's supposed to say sorry to me, you know? And that and her going and having that conversation with him, I think, especially rewatching all these episodes back to back, is a direct result of Emery admitting, I was, I was just a kid too. And McGann realizing like, oh, the fact that that is her excuse and yet I still want an apology means that that can't just be my excuse. He is owed an apology. It can't too. be your excuse. Yeah. And like, yes. it's the realizing that from another perspective that I think pushes her to be like, oh, I got to go have a conversation. Even though <laughs> McCom has done <laughs> seven other <laughs> ridiculous things that are a whole different problem. McGann is like, this I can apologize for. This we can have a conversation about. Yeah, this one I got. I got you on this one. You're totally right on this one. <laughs> Everything else, <laughs> WTH, man. Um, and that also kind of leads me a little bit into Emery's conversation, where she's like, "I'm an atheist scientist. I can't be asking a priest for like advice or whatever." That also brings a blind. I feel like Neil. I have questions. <laughs> um, you got. It's like saying that. It's like playing in a like a, a fantasy. D and D, you know, yeah. wheel of time world where there's gods and all of this stuff. Will little gods are literally. I think they even talk about this. Terry Terry Pratchett deals about this in Discworld, where it's like it's really hard to be an atheist when the gods just come down and kick your door in, <laughs> and then just run in to your house and nuke everything. It's like it's kind of hard. So an atheist has a different definition. I'm like, okay, so what does this mean? Like, does it mean that the mar- that like the Yalone are individuals who? can do magic but they think it comes from a divine source and so there's that's how i kind of these it. this magic divine thing and and emery's like no magic is just science she she pulls a wally and she's like magic is just science we can't explain yeah certain things or blah 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 i want there's a there's a whole there's a whole conversation to be had about that indeed I was just going to say, and other things designed to hurt us, uh, when Garfield hears Superman and briefly for one half a second line thinks that it's Connor, it, okay, uh, <laughs> what do I do with that uh, <laughs> other than cry? And I also just want to point out, like, rewatching this and thinking about how there is that little callback to failsafe and everything, 
you realize on a couple watch throughs that McGann has had to go through this exact experience twice now Mm -hmm. because this is exactly how Connor dies in failsafe. And this is exactly how McGann reacts and in failsafe just worse because, you know, there's a 10 year relationship there now. But it's the same thing of her trying to reach out to him telepathically, sobbing that she can't hear him anymore, freaking out in a situation where she could do nothing and yet still feels in some ways like there had to be something they could have done. And it hurts. And then our post credit scene is just her crying over their marriage altar because, mm -hmm. yeah, who needed to be stable on that Friday morning? It's fine. This is fine. You you were going to say something, Neil, too? Yes, Neil, please share oh. other thoughts other than Emily crying well, over a couple. Martian. Well, I mean, okay, I'll I'll do one that's that's related to the crying, and then I'll move away from it. But the, but I when he stops the bomb, I like that we are given like a half second of success before failure. Yeah, to like really yeah. think that maybe sure is he hurt? Yeah, but he'll be fine. He saved it. The virus disappears into the lava, and then. This plan would have worked. <laughs> yeah, absolutely would have worked. But uh, the other one I think of is uh, at one point in this, the Martian world building where Jim casually says, don't put thoughts into my father's mind. My late father's Yeah, mind. I love that. Uh-huh. Like, you know, like, don't put words into their mouth. My don't mouth. put thoughts into their mind. I was like, oh, it was delivered with the exact same, like, cadence that anyone would ever say that and, like, Beautiful. There was some, something that I was thinking of, too, is like, okay, if... All right, so how does Superboy and Superman's regeneration work? Or, like, invulnerability work, right? Do we, I don't know if we have any examples in Young Justice, right? So he's already bleeding when he's punching his way through the floor, which is why I was kind of hesitating about, like... He's like, oh, and Superboy destroys the bomb. And I was like, that was hard. That was hard for him. Yeah. That was not like, here, I'll take care of this. Give me a hot second. No, boy is punching his way through a floor and bleeding off of everything and then falls directly into lava. (laughs) And so I'm like, okay, so all of his clothes are gone and he is his skin is burning off. Right. So he I'm like, okay, so so say this explosion hadn't gone off. Did they pull him out of the lava? Does he get out of the lava? Maybe McGann gets down there after the explosion. She pulls his body out of the lava. They get him into the sun with some oxygen. Does he just now become invulnerable in the state he's currently in? Is it a regenerative ability or is it a prevent damage ability? And that would be interesting to me. We have an answer to this, but it's crashing the mode. Yeah, that's why I'm bringing it up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah because when i was watching it i was like wait what oh ooh, what's going on here uh oh no he's just super dead never mind yep we're good we'll never find out <laughs> he's dead and the the amount that connor is exerting and trying to get this thing done like i remember that shot of connor punching his way through the floor was in one of the early trailers at one point. And yeah. I remember when it got released, my thought, and I feel like a lot of people's thought, was that Connor was punching someone else to bleeding that yeah. much. Yeah. Because- oh, yeah. He was totally beating someone else, yes. Because when have we ever seen him bleed? That makes more sense. Because we had absolutely no framework for Connor ever bleeding. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was on purpose. Yeah. yeah it's, no, so it's- I'm like, oh, oh. Oh, Connor, what are you doing? Boy. <laughs> who, is, who, is, who has made you sad? Who did what now and wh- how did this happen? And then it's like, no, no, that's just him. And we're like, that's not better. Um, <laughs> no, it's not better. It's Well, it is better. <laughs> that's just also bad. That's just also bad. It's also bad. It's a different It's just bad. different bad. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Do we get everything wrapped up, we think? Everybody got what they needed? Out yeah. of the episode, <laughs> just clean tear ducts. Awesome. All right, let's head into the. Let's say, stick around. Class is in session. On today's Canary debrief, we are going to be talking about mysteries because one of the two things that happens more often than not in media is that either I feel very very confused even though it's over or i felt like i've known exactly what was going to happen the entire time 
hitting that middle ground is very, very difficult. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw shade on those two th- other things happening because as someone, and as often Canary debriefs do, tying it back to some of the RPG times, I can set up a puzzle for people to interact with. And one of those two things happens more often than not. Either they will immediately solve it, or I am going to need to force feed them clues in a way that is not fun. This manages not only to layer in um, how many threads with the death of the king, with the loss of the Zeta tube, with the explosion, with multiple explosions, um, but the idea that at the end of it, not only did it feel like, okay, I can see where these things came from, but also I am very surprised at the fact that these are both unrelated and how certain things are being resolved. And I would say, I would even layer in the idea that I still have questions. I think that's also a good way. Like a mystery can still be resolved, but me not knowing every single minute detail is also really beneficial because then me as the audience member, I have the opportunity to start to try and fill in even more backstories, uh, right, wrong, or um, something even (laughs) even farther away. But the (laughs) idea that this mystery managed to both resolve things and yank a few rugs out from under us, I think is really, really well done, especially done over only four episodes. I think, from my perspective, one of the pieces of advice I have heard people give about writing mysteries, especially mysteries on television, is about the idea that your audience needs to have all of the pieces that your characters have for it to be satisfying. Because if your characters go and find something out off screen and then just tell you, oh, I found out this thing and it's the most important thing and now I know who did it, that's not satisfying because your audience didn't have the chance to piece it together. And I feel like this arc does a good job of having every time the characters find the evidence, we are told what the evidence is and you have all of these pieces. And once it gets revealed, you're like, oh, that thing and that thing and that thing, and you can piece it all together. And if like, even watching it through, if you're making some leaps in logic or making some guesses, you can get there too. But the show also does a good job of leading you astray without feeling like it's being dishonest. Like, I feel like people didn't guess Sira immediately because she's here for other reasons too that don't feel flimsy. She isn't just here. It's like, she doesn't walk on screen and you go, oh, she did it because she's a new character we haven't seen before. She walks on screen and you're like, oh, you're here for the other subplot. And then you find out, oh no, she's here for every subplot. And it's it just all fits together. And I feel like that's part of what makes it interesting. It's like, it's not the most complicated mystery in the world, but the fact that we, both we, the audience and the characters are trying to solve this mystery as if it is immediately connected to two other mysteries is part of what makes it more complicated and interesting because it ends up, as you said, it's, these are all three separate things and only one of them is resolved. But the fact that we think that they're all connected makes the mystery more seem more complicated than it is and keeps you guessing along the way so that you don't get bored. And I love I love that you you brought up having the characters know the same thing as the audience because there are often shows where the characters in world know very little but we as the audience watching know so many other things. And then it also for for a podcast that was inspired by this one, Farm to Fable um, is a Smallville rewatch podcast. And one of the terms mm-hmm. that Michael uses in there is a Smallville leap of logic. Because <laughs> it's just like, you can't. No, that's not. You don't have the pieces to go from where you were to where you are now. Accurately describing all of the things that occurred while you were not there. That's the other kind of balancing act is that if the audience knows more than the characters in world... It's difficult then to have those characters reach the same conclusion without either being heavy handed one way or the other, either them just making a leap of logic that does it, that is hard to follow, or they're just hit with overwhelming evidence in the end. Absolutely. Yeah, I love how I love how Michael over at Farm to Fable, it's just such a common thing, you know, and to have that leap of logic. And I, I listen to a lot of I listen to a lot of audiobooks for Agatha Christie. Poirot does this. Holmes does this. Uh, pretty much everyone does this, where it's like, oh yeah, I know what the solution is. And when they di- when they explain it, it's like, oh yeah, that all makes sense. 
And also, by the way, you had this other piece of information that you knew because of you talked to a police officer yesterday and got this information you never shared with us. You know, so it's 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 that's a classic old school way of doing detective work. And you can do it and pull it off. Just try not to do that. (laughs) See if you can do it without doing it. You just got to you got to do it carefully and you got to at least hint that it's coming. You know what I mean? Like there's a difference between a character saying I'm going to talk to someone off screen you know, more subtly than that versus a character just goes and talks to someone off screen and then comes back later and they have the solution. Like you got to set it up at least a little bit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. All right. What are we on to next? Crashing the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four. At this point, that would be amazing. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. Connor's not dead. Bam. (laughs) Boom. We will not see the man in the... I looked it up just to ensure that I was correct. We will not see the man in the bubble in any capacity until episode 18. 18. Don't see I was until not wow. ready for that. I was not ready for that number. I, I, that's it. I was not ready. He did what he needed to do. <laughs> he did. But yeah, Connor's alive. Connor's in the Phantom Zone. We won't find that out until the Zatanna arc. And we won't get an explanation for that shadow on the wall until literally one of the last scenes of the finale, Mm. because that's how long it takes us to resolve that bit. But the important part is that Connor's not dead. He's just trapped in an alternate dimension, suffering from extreme wounds. And it'll be fine, though. He's fully lava burned for the rest of... No, he actually... Not a thing, actually. Yes, which is what we were getting at earlier about the thing that's crashing the mode is that when we finally yeah. get Connor out of the Phantom Zone, we, he needs to get back into the sun to heal because he is just wrecked. Um, <laughs> Jacked up. Bad um, things happen. Which we'll get, we get to later that I, again, is very well set up of I from the minute we started dealing with the Phantom Zone, I was just like, Okay, but what about Connor's injuries? When we get Connor out, are those going to be a pro? How does that work? Like, that was floating in the back of my head. And then we get an episode where Phantom Girl gets out of the Phantom Zone and, like, her whole arm is burned from lava and she immediately starts screaming. And I'm like, ah, okay, there's our confirmation. Connor is going to have a bad time in a couple episodes. (laughs) And you're like, luckily he doesn't get hurt more while he's, oh, he did. Good. Great. (laughs) Ah. Just those gaping wounds in your chest, good sir. Hope it works out. Like, if I remember <laughs> correctly, doesn't he just stumble out of the Phantom Zone and then, like, immediately fall over and just pool of oh, blood? Oh, and yeah, I'm like, yeah, and no. falls down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get that boy some some sun vitamins, please. Yay! Oh, wait a minute. No, he's super dead now. We get to do well, like, He gets to die in front of his eyes over again. <laughs> get him a plant. Get that kid a plant. But yeah, that's most most of the crashing the mode is just uh, Connor's not dead, and here's all the reasons why. <laughs> like that's all the crashing the mode. And it, it is <laughs> it is wild that we do not find out who uh, Zod is until like so much later. There is so there are so many mini arcs, and all these mini arcs are packed. Like Jesse, we we're just talking about like the next arc, <laughs> just the next arc. Yeah. It's just it's just a, it's just a couple few episodes, right? Yeah, exactly. We're talking like what four episodes? It's about four episodes per arc, yeah. right? That there yeah. was a plus or minus one. It's about four episodes per arc. There is so much just even in the next episode, guys. So much story, so much arc, so much character development that it's like I, I didn't want to use the word jarring. It's not jarring. It's just that it's like we've got a whole bunch of mini shows. So like, oh, okay, so I'm shifting out of, oh, yeah, Connor's dead. I get reminded of that. And that's rough. And the whole that's kind of the that's kind of the string, right? That 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 starts what's going on with Artemis. 
But then her whole thing is like, once you get to the end of that, then that string goes to the next thing. And then the next string goes to the next thing. And it's just like, oh, God. And then we get to episode 18. And I was like, oh, right, Connor. <laughs> like, we still don't know whether he's alive uh-huh. or not. But what happened? It was so long ago. Wait, now he's in the Phantom Zone? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, with the with those arcs, though, I mean, it really, I mean, it illustrates two things in my mind. And it's two things we've. I feel like we've talked about before. One is certainly that... Young Justice has the ability to do short form runs if, I mean, you know, because in the days of streaming, calling things parts and not seasons and yada, 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 right. and getting in a six to 10 episode run instead of, you know, 26. That's just a reality. I think Young Justice is proven with these that it could easily do that sort of thing yeah you know having it have a different name pick it up for a little bit tell the story but also tonally the ability to tell different stories depending on you know let's say you know uh, the powers that be as they are often described that if they want something that's horror well then we'll go back to the magic arc and we'll just go down that road and invite john constantine (laughs) and we'll have all the horror that we need yeah well, or the other is just like just slapstick and just be like, oh, the forever people are here. I don't know why there's so many geometric shapes, but man, they're exciting and fun. <laughs> I bro- so oh, I'm there fine. you go. Um, and there you go. The other thing is having Phantom Girl's power. <laughs> leave it to Young Justice. Having Phantom Girl's ability just just unapologetically connected directly to the phantom zone i don't again i'm not sure if that's ever officially established in any dc canon comic it's it's one of those just really obvious things but it also that that it that is that where where phantom girls home shifts into it's kind of like um oh gosh what's the name of that what's the name of that town emily you'd know the town the mythical town that shows up every hundred years in england the tarasque no not the tarasque (laughs) hold on you said this with such confidence, and I have no I idea what you're talking about. You had such confidence in me, and I'm like, I don't. You said it with enough confidence that I briefly was like, I should know what this is. Brigadoon. But I had no idea what you were talking Brigadoon. about. Brigadoon. Oh, it's Brigadoon. That's why you think Brigadoon I should know that. Brigadoon is a musical with a book. Got and it. Yep, it's a musical. Got it. mm-hmm. Thank you. It's a musical. I've never seen Brigadoon. Yeah, that's a. I, I get it. It's I just like a that thing. That was the plot of Brigadoon. <laughs> You can cut all that. Anyway, so it's like Brigadoon, right? It's this planet who, you know, disappears for a while and then comes back at, you know, plot intervals um, like the town of Brigadoon is supposed to do. So, like, does it all go into the Phantom Zone? And if it does, that doesn't seem like you want to go to where all the weird prisoners from Krypton are. And it, it, it leads to the idea of having a lot a lot of really interesting stories if they decided to do that. But I guess we can get into that. I don't know in another fourteen episodes, Neil, something like that. <laughs> yeah, we can leave. We can leave. <laughs> we can leave. <laughs> the I throw oh, out. I forgot to write this down because I thought of it in the middle of this crash in the mode. So this is the episode where Bioship leaves, and we all cry a little more for her, and we don't see her again until we find out that she went and scooped up the Legion of Superheroes <laughs> to help them make sure Connor isn't dead. Uh, cause she knows what her job is. Cause she's like, "Hey, I'm hey y'all, I'm retired. I'm not that retired. Ha, I'm back, and I brought these people. Uh, screw the timeline. I'm just a bioship. Bioship is retired until any of her her family is in trouble, and she's like, I'm coming out of retirement for one last job. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, she's retired. Like my dad's retired. Yeah, sure, dad. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna keep doing all the things you were doing. You just call yourself retired. I don't I don't understand what's happening here. Okay, great. But it's also it's just a good setup because like she leaves and we don't see where she goes and we see the Legion of Superheroes yeah. be like, oh, the thing's happening. We got to go help. And then we don't see them again for the rest of the episode, which even when this first premiered, that was part of my thought process of in my brain justifying to myself that Connor couldn't possibly be dead was because if Connor was dead, we would have seen them also having problems, right? right that makes sense this is how i'm gonna cope with this for another 18 weeks or however long it takes us to find out that connor's okay right because we see them 
We see them go, oh, there's time things happening. We have to run. And then we don't see what they actually do for the rest of the episode. But don't is don't they show up for not just for the rest of the episode? When's the next time we see them at all? But but part of that is also like they're in the end credits and we don't know when they are because we're not given timestamps and it's really unclear. And then you also have to factor in like, OK, I don't remember how they're traveling, but if they are traveling via Bioship, that takes them a month or whatever to get there. But then the Javelin is just like I'm everywhere whenever I need to be. So not only does baby need to take a month. Yeah. Bioship needs to take a month, whereas everything else, obviously, they can. Well, no, the Zeta tube is broken, but the communications are fixed. So then they can at least communicate. No, wait. Communications are broken, too. The communication satellite's broken. You think they can just bring another Zeta tube? But that means Superman goes back immediately. Superman and uh, the Javelin goes back to Earth immediately because in the next episode, they're finding out about Connor's death the day, the next day. Timing. Just the ju- ju- I like that the timeline is not even us talking about time travel complicating things. It's just actual travel complicating, <laughs> complicating things. Yeah, with everything from just even comparing the bio ships to the javelin. But anyway, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, we see her. We see Saturn Girl in episode nine, episode 12. As, but no, no lines. Okay. Are they like eating a hot dog on a sidewalk somewhere? Something yeah. like that at some point. And so that's the thing that I was thinking of when this was all happening was like, okay, we don't see the Legion anymore and we're not seeing Legion. I guess I get we're in a different story arc, but then also is if Superboy is dead, then the Legion doesn't really come about. That's kind of the, the conceit of the Legion. And so then we saw the Legion and I'm like, okay, so maybe he's okay, but maybe they're just stuck back in time and they can't go forward anymore. I don't know. It's, it's like, a la Bart. Yeah. Who knows? They got that. Yeah, like a la Bart. Whatever yeah, it's exactly. called. They've already it's established specific that. radiation of chroniton radiation, something like mm-hmm. that. Tachyon. Mm-hmm. Yep. Chroniton, tachyon, something on. Time. Uh, unobtainium. <laughs> unobtainium. <laughs> Just name it that. Nice. All right. I think I think we have crashed this mode enough. Hey, did we mention Superboy's still alive? Superboy's alive. Connor's alive and he's going to get married and it's going to be fine. Oh, Gar has a lot of problems. Gar has problems. Gar has additional problems. Gar should be retired now. Hey, we've added another reason to the list of why Garfield is having a time. Him like in that little reptile form and he's like got his hands. He's like his hands are like rubbing together and he's like sad. Or I was just like, oh, and then watching it this time was even worse because I was just like, I'm just He's doing the sad little little pangolin. Exactly. I'm watching. I'm watching his head just crack open. Like, oh, oh, buddy. Oh no! Somebody grab him quick, 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 quick. Yep. Where's Saturn Girl? Fix that boy's brain. Help him out. Where's Black Canary? Where's the one other superhero therapist? There's only one. There's two. The other one's Miss Martian, and she's a little busy at the moment. Please call back. All right. I think we're good. And with that. <laughs> If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. Stay whelmed, everyone. Stay whelmed, everyone. Stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. 
Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.